The Earth System, a video series for educational institutions for free use presented by the German Geological Society, the DGGV. Hello everyone. I welcome the viewers of another episode of my video series on the Earth System. In this video I want to have a look at those places on Earth where three lithospheric plates border each other. These are the so-called triple junctions. Earth's irregular plate pattern requires a whole series of such junctions with three adjacent plates. However, since all plates on Earth are in motion, it is geometrically impossible that more than three plates adjoin one another. And I will show that the triple junctions are essentially restricted to two different types. Although there are a few more geometrically possible, the two types that I will explain in more detail are the stable variants, meaning they remain even as plate movements continues. However, not necessarily stationary, but in their constellation. This illustration, which I used already in some other videos of this series, shows the Earth's plate pattern defined by plate boundaries. Here, however, we see only the large and medium-sized plates, but if we also count all the small plates, we can assume that there are around 50 independent plates today. An inevitable consequence of this large number of plates is that there are a lot of triple junctions where three plate boundaries meet. It must be so, because geometrically it wouldn't work any other way. And these plate boundaries are always of the three types that we know. They are all dynamic plate boundaries. That means they are subject to constant change. As already shown, at divergent plate boundaries the plates move away from each other. At convergent plate boundaries they move towards each other. And at transform falls they slide past each other. And these different movement patterns can meet at one point. As already mentioned, there are no junctions with full meeting plate boundaries because such a junction, if it were to arise at all, would be converted back into triple junctions immediately after formation due to the dynamic development. Okay, let's look at the different options for triple junctions. We can imagine various constellations of triple junctions all based on the three possible types of plate boundaries. Ridge, that's what the R stands for, deep sea trench, that's what the T stands for, or transform fault, that's what the F stands for. So we have R, T and F. A whole range of constellations are shown here in the figure, but not all of them are stable or even possible. Not only the type of boundary, but also the subduction polarity plays a role. It is important in which direction the subduction is going, which plate is subducting and which is the overriding plate. Let's take a look at the movements at the triple junctions. The arrangement of the different types here in this figure is exactly the same as in the previous illustration, except that here the plates, which are shown in different colors with yellow, gray and light blue, have been moved slightly away from their original position. The movement direction of the plates is marked by the red arrows. At some treble junctions you can see that holes would appear, here shown in black, if you consistently move the plates in the direction of the arrows. Of course, they do not develop such holes because such triple junction constellations are not possible. If, for example, three transform faults, such as the one at the top right, meet at a point, the triple junction would immediately be transformed in such a way that a stable situation arises. Here in the middle, in the third row, three different possibilities for a TTR triple junction are shown. TTR means trench trench ridge, two subduction zones and a mid-oceanic ridge. If the direction of the two subduction zones is the same as in the, in the left two TTR triple junctions, the triple junction remains. However, if the polarity of subduction is in the opposite direction, 
a new transform fault will arise between the two subduction zones or an extension of the mid-oceanic ridge downwards here would also be possible. Such changes also take place in other constellations that are initially possible but ultimately unstable. These changes in the constellation are primarily about the angle at which the plate boundaries meet. With this transformation, a stable treble junction can be formed from an unstable situation. In all of the situations that I have now highlighted here with the circles, a constellation ultimately arises in which two of the three plate boundaries end up being parallel to each other. Here, two triple junctions are enlarged slightly. In the TT off example of the left side, you can see that where one subduction zone was previously at an angle to the other, a transform fault has now formed that runs parallel to the one that was already there. The left subduction zone, however, no longer ends at a triple junction. At the TTT triple junction with three subduction zones, it is similar. Due to the plate movement, the boundaries shift so that in the end two subduction zones run parallel at the triple junction and only one at an angle to it. Here the subduction zone was extended and the lower left subduction zone no longer ends at a treble junction. On the right side of the figure various constellations are shown that can be assumed as stable at least over a certain geological period of time. In all cases two plate boundaries run parallel to each other at the treble junction. This is one of the most common types of triple junctions. Let's take a look at the effective movement at a triple junction using the simplest model, the RRR, the ridge, ridge, ridge triple junction where three mid-oceanic ridges meet. In this example, it is a very simple model with a star-shaped arrangement of the three ridges at 120 degrees to each other and with the same movement velocity at all three spreading centers. There are several examples of this type of triple junction on Earth, however not quite as symmetrical uh, as this example. I'll show two of them in the next video. Now let's first have a look at the principle of movement. On each ridge we assume a divergent movement perpendicular to the ridge axis as indicated here with the arrows. Spreading is considered to run parallel to the ridge axis. I'll show this in individual steps and start spreading at the upper segment. If you just carry out this movement, assuming that the spreading is perpendicular to the ridge axis, you can already see that it somehow doesn't fit. I want to show that it's not just a simple spreading like shown here. There is something else to add. This will become even clearer if we now try to perform the spreading at one of the lower segments, again perpendicular to the ridge axis. This results in a completely irregular and unsatisfactory result for the remaining ridge because spreading would not occur here symmetrically. However, the symmetrical spreading is basic requirement, quite apart from the fact that we actually assume the same spreading velocity for all ridges in this model, but that is not realized here. In short, it doesn't work that way geometrically because the arrows indicating the velocity in this very regular system should actually be all of the same length and arranged symmetrically to each other. In general, we can say, and this is valid for all spreading zones, that the direction of spreading at, at mid-oceanic ridges is in any case symmetrical and always takes place perpendicular to the ridge axis. There is no mechanism that could explain why more oceanic crust would form on one side of the spreading zone than on the other. Therefore, we have to assume symmetrical spreading. The main question here is what happens to the mid-oceanic ridge? Because in this figure it is now somehow slanted in the middle. 
And this is exactly where the key to the geometric development lies, because the ridge is displaced and does not remain stationary at the triple point. The parts of the ridges highlighted here in red are now newly formed extensions of the ridges towards the triple junction. As required, the divergent movement now takes place symmetrically on all ridges in the same way and, as mentioned already, perpendicular to the ridge axis. That means that the area colored in pink here is so to speak, filling the gap between the three plates that are moving away from each other. So new oceanic crust is also being formed there. The movements and new formations also show that the direction of plate movement in a higher level global reference system are different than the relative movements between the two adjacent plates. These are the three arrows here in the blue areas of the plates. To summarize, in this figure, this is shown again in combination with the hotspot volcano under the ridge axis, whereby the volcano or the volcanic chain formed on the mid-oceanic ridge traces the absolute plate movement. I will go into this and the relationship between the hotspot track and relative to absolute plate motion in more detail in the videos after next. In the following video, I would like to discuss a few real examples of triple junctions on Earth. Okay, this should be enough for now for the geometry of triple junctions. This time, thank you for listening and I'll be happy if you stick around. I recommend continuing with the video Triple Junctions on Earth.